rusty I am here. Okay, now we're recording. Okay, so this first question, uh, the answer is V equals 0, 0.0 meters per second. It's at rest. And that's what this means. Okay, when the graph starts there, the left side of the graph, the early end of the graph, if it starts at the origin of coordinates, that corresponds to zero, velocity equals zero. Question? No. Good? Okay. Question? No. On multiple choice, it's always just click a letter. But when we do numeric, it is waiting for you to t type a send. So that's why I always say, hit, we, we, and we'll hit the refresh key when we get to the numeric. Okay, so this one. All right, next question. Uh, and 80% 80, uh, 80 of you got that correct, lovely. Uh, but just remember that that's a good, so, so if, you know, when you're, when you're reading, you know, when you're, re especially my exams, you got to read them carefully. And when you're reading carefully, if, if I say something, it starts from rest, immediately think V equals zero. Or if it comes to a stop, if I use that phrase or something like that, immediately think V equals zero at the end of the motion. Now, this is the beginning of the motion. All right. Uh, object U. Uh-oh. Same question, different object. We're clicking. Get your clicker ready. And let me start this question. Uh, you guys are voting good. And uh, read carefully and vote. And just click A, B, C, D, or E, and I'll have your data. And I've got data for 73 of you now. You're doing good. Okay, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Good, 94 of you are voting. Um, and 74% of you got the answer correct. This one, it's moving to the left. Let's talk about this one for a minute. Um, when you have a velocity graph, there's some things that it tells you, but other things it doesn't tell you. Now, one of the things you can tell just by looking at it is, um, is it below the time axis? And if it's below the time axis, the speeds are negative. That means it's going to the left. If it's a, you know, as we're assuming here that it's a horizontal X axis motion. Now, eventually here, in a few minutes, we're going to be doing free fall, and then negative means downward velocity. And g, the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth, is always going to be a negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, but for this one, we have a positive acceleration. Um, slope is up to the right, but it starts negative. All right? So he's, he's heading this way, but he slows down, and he stops somewhere over here to the, to the left, and then he starts heading, and then, then over here, let me get my cursor here. Okay, over here is where he stops at three seconds. And then after the three second mark, now he's moving this way. Now he doesn't make it all the way back to the origin. Okay, and the, you know how you can tell that just by looking? The left side, the leftward motion uh, triangle is bigger, bigger area than this distance triangle up here, okay? Next question. Oh, uh, and so here, go ahead and add this to your notes. You could say, uh, another thing you could say, I mean, this, this could actually be, you know, I could have put this for option E. It's moving to the left and the speedometer reads nine meters per second. Now, your cars don't have meter per second markings uh, on your speedometer. It's usually miles per hour and kilometers per hour, but, you know, theoretically you could have meters per second. And if you did, it, it, it would say nine meters per second when you're moving that speed. It, um, 
regardless of the direction, you know, north, south, east, west, you know, going out university, coming in on university, down to, Alif down to Waterford Lakes or, you know, up to Oviedo and Alafay, it doesn't matter, you know, nine meters per second, 20 something miles an hour, uh, you know, it, it does, the speedometer doesn't tell you that, but this graph does. So remember that this velocity graph encodes a lot of information and you uh, hacking through those matching questions had to, you know, mentally extract some of that to answer those correctly. All right, now here's a tougher question and you can extract this answer. What is the acceleration of object W? And this one's multiple choice, but you kind of have to do a little calculation. If you remember your acceleration concepts. And let me start this question. Okay, you can start voting for this. Casey, did you get your votes in yet? Good. Trying to remember names. Call it. Evan. Connor. Katie. Just practice the names here while you guys vote. Okay, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Four, three, two, one. Axel, you ready to go? All right, man. Uh, okay. Axel, get your clicker out. I'll give you a chance to click here. Get your clicker. Good. Break that baby out. Let's get let's get a click in for you. Give you a break. And I see that most of you guys have got a good. We're analyzing this velocity graph. So, Kwame, it's, this, part, this part's easy. Figuring out acceleration, right? Yeah. Well, you know. Okay, good. All right, let me stop this. Uh, yeah, most of you, 71% of you got this one right. 1 1.2. Now, if you, it, uh, a bunch of you got it wrong. Uh, let's just review the concept here. On a velocity graph, the rise over the run, ooh, ooh, that should be A. That should be acceleration A instead of D for distance. I recycled this equation. Sorry about that. I'll change it before I make the podcast or the YouTube, uh, the acceleration is rise over run. So in this case, the rise is six meters per second from rest all the way up to six meters per second. And the run is horizontally five seconds. Uh, and so the quotient of that is 1.2 meter per second per second. And you can, you know what guys, on a multiple choice questions, and stuff. Uh, I'll sometimes write an acceleration as meter per second per second, but it's just as good to write meter per second squared. Now, the reason I do meter per second per second sometimes is because you don't have to use uh, exponents uh, and it takes up less room. But both of those are equivalent, they're both kosher. All right, let's do another question together. Uh, which statement about object W is true? And for those of you that just got here, read carefully and come up with an answer, if you can. And I'll give you a hint. 
Dun, 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 dun. Think about the area of that triangle. Man, I can't believe I just gave you that hint. This is going to guarantee everybody gets it right. Okay, I'm only going to give you five more seconds to vote. No, I'll give you more time than that. So you guys are changing here. A lot of people are changing their votes. <laughs> it's a good hint then. Ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ninety-seven students. Good. All right. Zero. All right. We got you guys are doing good. Uh, most of you got that right. Um, it's it moves 15 meters to the right. It's rightward motion because it's above the time axis. All right. So that area up there, you count it as an additional 15 meters from wherever it was that it started. All right. Now you can't tell from make a note to yourself, a graph like this does not tell you your initial position. It does tell you your initial velocity. But if you want to know exactly where this person is going, where they are after five seconds, you also have to know the initial uh, X coordinate and then just add 15 meters to that. Okay. So this guy, um, and the interpretation is the area of the distance triangle. See, that I wrote this question first, and then I copied it, and I, I made it into the previous question. That's why the previous question still had the letter D in it. Uh, but distance, ba triangle, distance triangle, area, base times height divided by 2. Uh, or the uh, generic acceleration distance formula, if you're starting from rest or if you're coming to a uh, a stop, uh, one half at squared. Uh, so you plug in your uh, for base times height divided by two, five seconds times six meters per second, uh, and then divide that by two. So that's thirty divided by two, fifteen. Uh, the other way you do it is just put in, and this is why you needed that previous question, one point two meters per second squared. So I wrote this question, then I decided I need to get you guys to compute one point two meters per second squared, but it's all in there. And the, di you know, the one half base times height encodes all the, you know, the, the 1.2 meters per second squared in a slightly different format than in, in one half AT squared, but it's all in there. And notice that five seconds quantity squared is 25 square seconds. Square seconds. Does that make, make a whole lot of sense like square meters? Uh, but uh, we cancel them. You can see there that they cancel. So uh, here's the general formula that we used uh, for that last uh, equation, d equals 1 half at squared. And remember, this is a simple distance calculation. And it's not, it's good for if you start from rest or if you come to a stop. All right. But if you're if you're trying to figure out a position, you also have to know the x coordinate to start. And you also have to know if you've, if you've got any initial velocity. All right. But if, if you're starting from rest, good. If you're, if you're coming to a stop, this will work. Okay. Now, I want to work on the case of free fall with you. So we're going to do some notes now. We're going to come back to clicking, though, in just a few minutes. Uh, and we're going to actually refine the formula just an eensy weensy bit. And, uh, and then we're going to put it all together into that big fancy formula that we saw on day two, on lecture two. Connor. Uh, sorry for the velocity Connor, what's your last name again? Smallwood. Smallwood. Connor. Connor McLeod of the of the clan McLeod. Yeah, very good. Like the immortals. All right. The Highlander. Okay. Question. Yes, 
Yeah, that's right. If it was a if it was a distance rectangle, then it'd be five times six, right? So the distance rectangle corresponds to something that's got a a smooth speed all the way through, constant velocity. So and we're going to deal with that here in a second. Put we're going to put it all together. Now here's some guys jumping out of a perfectly good airplane, and as I've shown, I've shown you guys this picture before, um, and. I want to reemphasize something I say in chapter two that Galileo chose free fall uh, as the simplest acceleration to study. And he used it to model all accelerations and thank God he did because it, it's right on the money. It's extremely uh, useful that he used that. So he didn't, so in other words, he didn't use um, uh, the acceleration of wind or something like that. He just used, used free fall. Now, here's this famous leaning tower of Pisa. Um, and here's a, here's a sentence that he wrote in one of his books. He was a prolific writer. If now we examine the matter carefully, we find no addition or increment more simple than that which it repeats itself always in the same manner. Now, he got that from studying free fall uh, straight down from the Leaning Tower of Pisa and from studying ramps. And we're actually going to talk about his, his ramps um, theories today. Um, so here's kind of what he's thinking about. He's going he's gonna to drop it from rest like we've just been talking about. And he's going to hit his stopwatch. All right. Then when he gets to the bottom, he's going to hit it again. So if he, if he drops it from rest at time t equals zero, the speed is zero. All right. So that's just like the one half a t squared. So we're going to have an equation here for the distance traveled um, from the top of the leaning tower of Pisa, uh, similar to one half a t squared. All right. In the first second, he gains nine point eight meters per second of downward speed. So go ahead and add that to your table. All right, and we're just going to extend this table down for a few seconds. Now, he said no addition or increment more simple than that which repeats itself always in the same manner. So if you go another one second, you're going to be at 19.6. Every second of free fall, you add another 9.8 meters per second downward. All right, now that's if you're going... To the floor. Now, if you're on the way up, you lose that much, and we'll talk about that. On the way up, you know, you're going to be, you know, losing 9.8 meters per second of up. If you had 9.8 meters per second of upward speed in one second, it's gone. All right. But if you're on the way down like this, you're getting faster and faster. So at three seconds, time t equals three seconds. Da da da. 9.8 times three. 29.4 meters per second. So another increment of 9.8. And it's dittos all in four seconds. Is it getting boring? Because if it's getting boring, let me tell you what that means. If, and, you know, anything that gets boring, you know what it means? It means you understand it. You've got it wired. And that's, so I'm just going to put etc. down here. Because that's the, you know, ditto marks all the way down until it hits the ground, then it stops. Okay, but it, that's the pattern. And the, just make a note, the direction is downward. So that right hand column, the speed column, you can think of that as the speedometer reading. You know, if his, if his cannonball had a speedometer on it, uh, Deshonda, then, you know, it'd, it'd be, you know, those read if he had a speedometer marked in the metric system on his cannonball, that's what he'd have. All right. And so the increase repeats itself always another 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. Now, what that means is that we have a nice straight line segment, always the same tilt, you know, it's not flat. It's not constant speed. It's got a tilt, okay, but it's downward. Connor. Well, 
Those guys jumping out of that perfectly good airplane, you notice they didn't pull their ripcord. They were, they were skydiving. And eventually, you know, they, you know, they pull a ripcord and stuff. But you get to such high speeds in parachuting that you eventually reach terminal velocity, they call it. And that means that you, you get, because when you're moving through the atmosphere, you're getting air resistance. So that's like a, you know, you're going this way downward and the air resistance is holding you, you know, a little bit of, and the faster you go, the more you get. So eventually that upward push from the air resistance, it's like friction, exactly balances the pull of gravity and then you don't have any uh, net force. You stop accelerating and your velocity is constant. That's the terminal velocity. So theoretically, yes, there is a, a, a point. And it also, the thing about terminal velocity, uh, it depends on the shape of the object. So if, if a guy belly flops, you know, the way they, you know, when you see pictures of skydivers, they're, they're, a lot of times they'll, they're doing, they got their hands and their arms out like this, and they're doing a belly. But sometimes you see them, you know, curl up into a ball and so they can change position. You know, if there's two groups of skydivers and they want to go to, you know, they change their, their shape into a ball, and that, but then you got to know what you're doing because if you get too close to the ground, you know, you, you pop your chute, you're still dead if it's not, if it doesn't open fast enough. So, but yeah, you can change your, your position and stuff. Uh, you know, you know what else is cool? These guys that have those body suits where they have like the Batman or the wings and stuff. And I've seen guys like over in Europe, up in the Alps, where they don't go up in a plane, they jump off a cliff. And they, you know, it's on YouTube. You, know, you see these guys on YouTube. Oh, my goodness. And they go flying down this valley in the Alps. You know, eventually they pop their chutes, but man, that's got to take some some gumption to do that. But uh, but a baseball, you know, even a, you know a baseball is going to experience some air resistance. It's not going nearly as fast as a as a skydiver at terminal velocity, but you know, so but we usually ignore it for stuff like baseballs and stuff, but. You know, if you were, but you know, here's the guy, the guys that cannot ignore it uh, are golfers because, you know, you're, you know, like Tiger Woods or one of those guys, you know, they're, they're trying to get it as close to the, to the, uh, what do they call that thing? The, the, no, they're not to the green, but to the pin, you know, they're trying to get, you know, they're trying to get a hole in one, right? If they can. And so they got to, you know, they're worried about inches you know, forward and back, you know. And so, you know, those guys really want to know about the effect of gravity and air resistance on their, on their uh, ball. So they adjust their, you know, it's a, it's a feel that they have. I mean, they, they're not out there with a little calculator or anything. But I've seen on TV, you know, you watch these golf matches on Saturday afternoon when there's absolutely nothing else to watch. And they have the, did you ever see that thing where they, they actually have a radar thing on the ball and they show you the arc of the ball? They can actually measure that. And the golfer doesn't do that, but the guys with the TV cameras and stuff do it. You know, the, the, the sports network. Uh, and those are not perfectly parabolic. They're not symmetric. You know, they're, uh, they're affected by... Uh, air resistance, but we're gonna th we're gonna ignore air resistance for for the first part here. So we've got this situation where we've got nice equal increments every one second of run. We have a dip of nine point eight meters per second downward. All right, so that means we have a distance triangle. But which one of these triangles? is the right one and you know are we going to have a positive slope or one uh for which the rise over the run is negative ah you see the mistake here dr b the blue one is supposed to be negative and the pink one is supposed to be positive 
I'll change that before I, I YouTube this. Anyways, so we gotta, we got to figure out the right kind of a triangle. Now, before we do that, let's look at free fall acceleration at the surface of the Earth. The customary symbol, as I've mentioned before, is G. Uh, 9.8 meters per second per second, as we had in the table. And uh, you can write it as 9.8 meters per second squared. That's perfectly fine. And this was the water balloon problem. You know, that's what you, that's what you use, 1 half AT squared, uh, with this for the acceleration. And that works fine. Um, so um, the formula A equals delta V over delta T in general applies to, to this. And for that reason, we can use um, the uh, simple uh, drop distance formula uh, for free fall. Now, here's a good velocity graph without that bloop, that typo from the previous slide. Um, now, this is U on top of the... Roof at the library with a water balloon. And you see your roommate walking down below you, so you decide to, you know, uh, give him some excitement. So you drop the water balloon. Now, here's the, here's the velocity graph. Now, this one has a minus sign in it, all right? But it's still going to give us uh, a uh, velocity triangle. Here's a, here it is. Go ahead and shade that in. And now this graph, notice, I, I don't have it listed there as Vy. This is v, v subscript Y, the Y component of the velocity. Now, if you drop it straight down, that's all you have. You just have a Y component vertical. And it's getting faster and faster, and it's negatory. It's, so the, the, t the little table that we had uh, a few slides ago with Galileo and the Leaning Tower of Pisa and stuff, um, that was a speed table. This is now a velocity graph. So I have my minus signs in there to symbolize or to signify the direction, which is downward. All right? It starts at zero. So this is you at the top of the library. And actually, this is the top of a really big building uh, because it'd probably be about two seconds a free fall, not even, to get from the top of the library down to the sidewalk. But anyway, so this is the top of a big, tall building, and five seconds of free fall. So now the rise is delta V equals G delta T. And for this one, you have to use minus because it's a negative rise. It's dipping. All right. And over here, the run is still to the right, delta T. All right. And so it, for, for this, for the velocity graph to be accurate, you have to have negative signs. You're in the bottom half of the graph below the time axis. If all you care about, though, is the distance that it falls, then you don't really have to worry about the minus signs, and you can just use this formula, one-half gt squared. And in this formula, um, the drop distance formula, the simple drop distance calculation, in other words, from rest, or, a, you know, the other way that you can use this formula is um, a straight pop-up. You know, you're, on the, you're playing baseball, you pop, you know, sometimes you hit a pop-up and it doesn't go out to the pitcher and it doesn't go over to the dugout and, and get caught. It goes straight up and straight back down once in a while. All right, so that means you start with, so the initial speed is, you know, 10 meters per second or whatever it is, and then it stops at the top of the arc and then it falls back down with the same amount of time. So the, the rise time to get to the top of the arc and then the, the drop time to get from the top of the arc that back down to the catcher's mitt is the same. And you can use the same formula for that. But anyways, 1 half gt squared, and that's the area of this distance triangle.
Okay, it's a, it's a one half base, base times height situation. Now we're going to do an example uh, from the Mines of Moria uh, on Clicker, and we're going to do some numeric input. So hit the refresh key, and let me change my question here to numeric. Um, and let me start it. So for those of you that have just got here, if you haven't used your clicker for the first time until today, anybody have no base? Okay, if you have no base, then what you want to do is hold the power button down until the rectangle flashes in the upper left, and then type DD. And then when you uh, get that, it should say go nitro and then ready. Got it? Okay. If you have a if your other class uses frequency C B, then yeah, you gotta do that for that. And then switch back to D D here. Just takes a second. It doesn't change if you turn it off, it'll it'll stay at D D. And if your next class is a C B though, you'll get a no base until you change it. So it's pretty easy to do. All right, so let's do another question here. Here it is. Um just like uh, Pippin, you drop a rock down a well. You hear the splash at time t equals 3.2 seconds. And that led to a lot of danger for those guys. Okay, so, uh, and remember, hit the send key. And give me your answer to the nearest... Something point something something of meters. The nearest 0 0.01 meters. Okay, and if you're sitting with somebody, you can double check with them and, you know, calculate and whatnot. What are you writing on your hand? I just saw you writing on your hand. I do that too. I'm going to, you know, write something on my hand. Careful now. Be very careful with your calculation. And don't forget to hit the send key. So to and and unfortunately the uh, let me turn on some lights. A few guys up in the front. Hold on. The the decimal point is pretty pathetic, so you just gotta. That's good. Uh, the decimal point is really bad. I'm sorry it's so small. So just try to. Uh, some of you guys, a lot of you have the right answer, but there's a little bit of bloop and be careful with those decimal points. And you guys, you can, you can resend your answer, uh, a second, you know, 17 times if you want until I close the question. So you can definitely change it if you, if you feel like it. How deep is the well? This is just like the water balloon problem, actually, from homework. So hopefully you guys will get it good here. Okay, one minute.
30 seconds. I can hear everybody clicking. That's good. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ninety seven students. Good. Um, yeah, let's take a look at the results here. Let me see if I can make this bigger. All right, here are the results. Um, let me move this out of the way here. Okay, negative 50.18. Uh, you know, that's not correct, but I'm going to mark it correct. That would be more of a position. For a drop, to, if I ask you distance, just give me a positive number, all right? And it, but if I ask you a position, then I have to tell you, oh, great, where's the zero point of the y-axis? And if you say that the top of the well where Pippin was is the zero point of the y-axis, then, yeah, this would be the position, negative 50.18. Uh, Twelve point four. Trying to think. See, look at this. Twenty five point oh nine. That's exactly half the answer. So this particular individual must have divided by two. One time too many. Now here's a. Here's a uh, bad round off. I think that's a bad round off. Here's a bad round off. Here's a bad round off. Most everybody, is that it? 50.21. Uh, yeah, this is. Here, now look at this, 501 and 5018. The, these guys for, couldn't see the decimal point. You're going to have to get used to that. All right. Uh, you're going to have to get that, get a handle on the decimal point. Sorry about that, guys. There's no, um, no substitute for that. All right, let's take a look at the calculation. Uh, one half GT squared. You can use 9.8 positive for this calculation. You can't use 9.8 negative on the velocity graph, but in this calculation, yes, you can. So here's your plug-in: 0.5 for one half, 9.8 meters per second squared for G, and you may use the positive version of it, so you want a positive answer here. And then 3.2 seconds, quantity squared. Now you gotta square the 3.2 and you gotta square the seconds. So your next stage, okay, the first two parentheses up here on top um, are combined into 4.9 meters per second. So this is like if you're doing it on paper, and not in your calculator, you know, this, this is kind of an intermediate step, all right? And I don't want to leave anybody behind, so, it, you know, so we're going through it step by step. Now, 10.24, that's 3.2 quantity squared. 3 squared is 9, so 3.2 squared is going to be a little bit bigger than that, 10.24. And then seconds quantity squared is, is this in. And notice that the second squared is inside the square bracket. All right. You got to be now. Here's the nice thing about the second squared inside the square bracket, and the second squared in the denominator of the first parentheses. They cancel, right? So cancel those babies out. All right, and but you can't cancel out the meters, which is good because you want a distance. You know that should be left over. All right. And so then you just calculate those two together. So 4.9 times 10.2, so that's, you know, 50 point something. Works out to 50.176. And then, so, that, so then you got to ask yourself, okay, uh, the instructor wants me to give 
what precision in my answer. Okay, so then you go like this. All right. 50.18. So that's pretty deep. And uh, so a drop distance calculation like this, if I say distance, give me a positive number. If I say position, then, you, you know, you want to worry about is it below the axis or above? and Is it to the left or to the right? And we'll do an example of that for homework. So free fall acceleration at the surface of the earth. Um, if you're doing a drop distance, if you look it up in the front cover of the textbook or any textbook, uh, you'll, it'll be reported as 9.8 meters per second squared, a positive number. So just be aware that if you're working on a position, as we're about to do, you want to use a negative number in there. Now, we're still going to use the symbol G. So you have to remember from the context to use a minus 9.8 or a regular 9.8. Okay, so you have to be a little bit um, judicious in your thinking. So what we're going to do now is put together Galileo's formula for the y-coordinate of a baseball or a cannonball or any other projectile. Uh, but first, a question, Axel. Axel's asking me, would the weight of the object matter? In other words, a feather versus a rock? And the answer to that is no. And that's what Galileo found. You know, he did the, the, the cannonball and the musket ball, totally different masses, and they hit the ground at the same time. Now, in, and, and that's because they're, pretty, they're both pretty heavy. But they're both round, same shape. So, But now, if you do the same thing with like a, a cannonball and a feather from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, the feather's going to go like, you know, it's going to skip down and it's going to take se many seconds to get to the bottom. It's going to be way late, if, if at all. I mean, if, it might not even land on the ground. The wind might take it and, you know. But, you know, they've done this on the moon. They took a feather... In the, one of the uh, Apollo missions, they took a hammer. They had a hammer on the spacecraft, you know, part of their equipment, I guess. And they, had a, they took a feather with them, and they filmed it up on the moon because the moon has no atmosphere. So there's no air resistance on the moon. And they fell at exactly the same speed. So, you know, they just went, Voot! whereas on Earth, you know, one would go straight down, the other one would go, you know, like this. So, you know, in practical terms, yes, you are correct. But uh, in idealized terms, this is, you know, it's a, it's a little bit, we think of it as a little bit simpler. We're kind of thinking about as if the entire Earth is a vacuum, which it's not, but, you know, for f first approximation, it's, it's a good enough approximation. Good? Colin. The question is, is the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth still 9.8 meters per second squared on the moon? No, it is not. It is because it's a different planet. I mean, it's a, it's a different object. It's about a sixth. So what is 9.8 divided by six? That's 15, 1 point, 1 1.63, right? So there's, that's, it's about, you know, 1.63. And, you know, if you, if you watch those movies of the Apollo astronauts, they can leap. You know, their muscles are used to hoisting us. You know, uh, an, uh, an, an Apollo astronaut could jump, you know, like uh, a vertical jump of, you know, 24 inches maybe, two feet off the ground, right? Except they're wearing those big suits. So maybe, let's say, a foot off the ground on Earth. But up there on the moon, they're, they're jumping, you know, way up there because gravity's weaker up there and now here's another thing um, you don't really notice it uh, in the space station or the shuttle but gravity's a little bit weaker than 9.8 up there because the further you get away from the earth as we're going to see uh, in chapter four or chap the end of chapter three 
uh, gravity gets weaker with distance away from the center of the, of the planet. And so uh, those guys up there, now they're all, everything is, those guys in the space station, we call it zero gravity, but it's really, uh, they're really in free fall. Okay, and everything is falling at the same rate, so everything seems to be weightless relative to them. But they're in orbit, and they're being held in orbit by the gravitational pull of the Earth. Uh, they're on a fairly circular orbit. And, uh, but yeah, that's what we call it, we should call it microgravity. Okay, and they could simulate that. You've seen the, you know, that, that famous movie that's, that's really good, I recommend it, in addition to Hidden Figures, Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks and a bunch of those guys. Uh, they actually filmed that a lot of the weightless sequences um, a few seconds at a time in a real weightless simulator. You know, NASA has this airplane to train the astronauts. You know, and it goes up into a steep, a steep climb and then it rolls over and then it goes, it dips down again. And during that rollover, for a few seconds, everybody's weightless. It's kind, you know, it's kind of like if you've ever been on a, a roller coaster. Raise your hand if you've ever been on a roller coaster. Okay, raise your, all right, I'm not going to ask, but think to yourself, have I ever puked my guts out on a roller coaster? Have you ever seen it? But you know, you get, you know, if, you, if you're, to, at speed and you go over the top of the roller coaster you know your stomach feels like it's about to boop, you know and the same thing you know so they so they do that's how they film that movie that's real weightlessness and i think that's the only movie that they've ever done that with so all the other weightless scenes that you see they're well done and stuff they look nice but they're not they're not actual weightlessness but apollo 13 that movie was and that was, the, the, the guys at NASA like that movie, so that means it's a good movie. Um, all right, let's get this formula that we saw on day two uh, and put it together. The one that, we, you know, YF equals YI plus VIY times T, et cetera, et cetera. Let's put it all together. Here we go. Now, here's my baseball. Now, we're just going to measure the motion vertically the first half of the baseball's arc all right so this distance here uh, is from y subscript f or to y subscript f from y subscript i so the initial y coordinate y i and the final y coordinate the top of the arc so that's the height that's the position above the outfield so if yi is zero at home plate, then yf would be how, how high does the baseball rise above the surface of the playing field, all right? Now we have a formula for that. We, let's write it out again. Here it is. yf is equal to yi. So your initial y coordinate, the velocity graph won't tell you that. So you, got, you have to know that. And then distance triangle, if you have some initial upward speed, so VIY stands for the initial vertical speed. And, if, and this one's moving upward to start. You know, you, if, you, if you hit a straight shot back at the pitcher, then VIY is zero. All right? You decapitate the pitcher on pitcher's mound. All right, straight shot, VIY equals zero. But if you're, if you're heading to the outfield, you know, or you're, you're going for the, the cheap seats, a home run, you know, you got to have a little bit of upward speed initially. Okay, so this might be 20 meters per second or 27.5 meters per second times T. All right, now that's, where, that's how far the ball, that would give you the position of the ball if there were no gravity. You know, just keep, you know, if you were out in space and you hit the ball at a certain speed, you know, a certain, you know it just keep on going until the cows come home. But if you have gravity, you've got one half GT squared. And in this one, you definitely have to use negative 
So let's, let's, do, let's do a little annotation of this big fancy formula. Here we go. Y subscript I, your initial Y coordinate. Now the X coordinate we're going to talk about, we're going to put it all together. Uh, but in this, in this equation, we've separated the Y coordinate and the X coordinate. The Y coordinate is pretty easy. Or excuse me, the X coordinate is pretty easy. So Y subscript I, that's where you start it. And the, you know, the velocity graph, as I mentioned before, doesn't encode that. So you got to have this. Okay, you got to know where you start. And then here's a distance rectangle, V times T. All right, and, and Axel, this is where you'd be going if you, this is what you'd need if, if all you have is terminal velocity. You know, you don't have any more, G is now canceled out if you're at terminal velocity. So that's all you'd need, you know. Uh, but if you're still accelerating, you have a distance triangle and you got to use negative 9.8 meters per second squared in that. All right, and what I'm going to do is uh, set up a, well, I'm going to give you a regular weekend size homework assignment because I forgot that today's Thursday. But uh, you're going to have a little homework assignment uh, this afternoon, hopefully, uh, lunchtime tomorrow, maximum. Uh, and I'll set up a, a few practice items. Uh, I've got one where a guy climbing up a rock, you know, up a cliff, a rock climber, uh, drops one of his... Uh, one of his objects, and you're going to figure out the position. So remember, figuring out a position, you have to have a minus sign. By the way, if you are on top of the, you know, this is a good one. Maybe I'll, I'll make one for this. On top of the, El, the Empire State Building. Raise your hand if you've ever been on, on the Empire State Building. I was, I was up there s several times. It's pretty cool. You know what? Raise your hand if you've ever been to the top of the World Trade Center. You know, I was up there. My dad used to take, you know, I grew up in New Jersey, and, and my dad worked in the financial district downtown, about six blocks from the World Trade Center. And he would sometimes bring us, bring all of us kids, six kids, you know, me, two brothers and three sisters, and my mom, and he'd take us to breakfast. There's this beautiful rest, a really expensive restaurant at the top of the World Trade Center. They had, you know, for brunch. And oh man, it was fancy. They had, you know, just really, and, and then the view that you could see all of New York Harbor and everything, it was really beautiful. Five days from ne next week, next Monday is 9-11. I haven't thought about that for a while. I can't believe, you know, if you, eh, the most famous thing about 9-11, no, I shouldn't say the most famous, but one of the truly horrible things about it is that those two buildings collapsed. No one, if, if you were ever up there, I used to, I went to NYU in New York City for my undergraduate. So I'd ride the trains with my dad from New Jersey and he'd get off by the World Trade Center and I'd keep going up to, to a Greenwich Village for NYU. But sometimes I'd get off with my dad and walk up from, from the World Trade Center. And you know, any number of times I walked by that World Trade Center. And I just, it, that day when I saw them collapsing, I thought, oh my God, that's such a huge building. The, the footprint of that building was enormous, and there were two of them, and they both collapsed. I, I had a hard time believing that, but I mean, it's, it happened. Anyway, um, Empire State Building, let me get back to that. If you're up on top of the Empire State Building, and uh, you know, they, you know they, they got big, they have this big, like railing and you can't really, and then they got this like fence that curves back in so you can't climb out, 
you know, and, and jump off and stuff like that. And you can't even, but if you could throw something, if you could go to the floor below that and open a window and throw something downward, then VIY here would be a negative number. You know, because you just got a little bit of a downward. You know, so you got some sideways, you're, you're throwing it across the street, and if you're also throwing it downward, that'll give you, uh, you'll use the same equation. And you just calculate whatever the position is. So, so this equation will work for the y coordinate, pretty much any, any kind of a free fall situation uh, that you may think about. All right. So now um, you can think about that f equation describing the y coordinate of a Ferrari being driven off a cliff. And this is going to get us into. Uh, Galileo's law of inertia and then uh, Sir Isaac Newton's three laws of motion. So the argument between Aristotle and Galileo, you know, that only forces cause motion for Aristotle. Um, he said that all force is from some kind of a mover, some kind of a force, excuse me, all motion is from some kind of a mover or force. And Galileo said, yeah, there are forced motions, but also there's an unforced motion which doesn't accelerate. And it, it neither slows down nor speeds up. And he used, the, well, he wasn't thinking about Ferraris, but we could think about Ferraris. And he was thinking of an object rolling along a plane uh, a, a frictionless horizontal plane, and then going over the edge. Now, up on the frictionless plane, he said, uh, the object is indifferent to being at rest or in motion. Okay? So if it's flat and he's, it's frictionless and so forth, it's just going to, whatever speed it has, it doesn't care. It's going to keep that speed. And if it's at zero uh, velocity, it's going to stay at that. So that's what, that's what Galileo said. If it's in motion, it will persist in constant velocity until it leaves the plane, i.e. the Ferrari driving off the cliff. And, when he, and, and you read Galileo's uh, books, and that's what he thinks about. He doesn't think about a Ferrari, but he thinks of, of that plane. And then when it comes to the end, the object will then fall in a projectile motion. Okay, and it will have acceleration due to gravity. And so this idea of a Ferrari driving off a cliff is, um, is it, you know, that's what that last formula was about. Yf equals yi plus viyt plus one half gt squared. That's the y coordinate for a Ferrari driving off a cliff. All right. And he proved that this state, that Aristotle would have denied constant velocity on that, that hypothetical horizontal plane, he proved that that had to exist using ramps. And what we're going to do is walk through the logic of Galileo's argument. And this is the prime argument that he used to break Aristotle's hold on all of physics. And, and, that's, and th this is the prime argument by which he established himself as the uh, professor for all of us, the professor of science for all of us. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at this statement of Aristotle. Let's say that you and Aristotle the ob say that the object will move along the horizontal plane only if it has a certain amount of push force. That's what Aristotle said. Yeah, okay, horizontal plane, frictionless, nice, but you still need a little bit of force. And Galileo said, no, not really, and I'll prove it. And, and he did. So let's look at this. Okay, so here's the picture. Horizontal plane, right, there's the car. And we got a little push force. And let's say that Aristotle says, well, okay, in the metric system, 0 0.02 metric units of force. And it'll have constant speed. You know, V equals constant. All right, so that's what Galileo uh, was challenging. All right, so Galileo, so let me park this diagram up here. Okay, so Galileo said, yeah, that's nice. 
But, you know, there's also a weight force. And Galileo said, there's a weight force acting on that car. All right. So, so Galileo said, all right, 0 0.002 metric units of force. And it's going to have a weight force, too. So it, let's just say that it's a good round number, 0 0.100 metric units of uh, weight force downward. All right. So there's... So the two, there's the two forces. You know, Aristotle wasn't thinking about gravitational weight force, but he knew about it, of course. And uh, Galileo said, yeah, let's, let's think about this weight force, because it, it actually is part of the thinking. So let's copy. Let's copy the push force, all right? And we're going to copy the weight force. Right, so I have two copies, one copy of each vector. And let me push this one over here, over to the side. Make that one vertical. And let me tilt this one. All right. So those two arrows, one of them is 0 0.02 and one of them is 0 0.100. The ratio between those two line segments, those two arrows, is 5 to 1 or 1 to 5. Okay, so write that down. Hypotenuse is five times longer than the height. Raise your hand if you've had trig class. Okay, so in trig class, <laughs> trig class, you can, you can make a, a trig ratio out of that. But for us, we'll just say one to five. Okay, so the rise and the hypotenuse are in the ratio of one to five. Hypotenuse and the rise, five to one. You can write it that way as, as well. All right. Now, Galileo said, you know, and, and, and Aristotle is, is over there saying, come on, Galileo, what, what, what's, what's with this ramp business? What's with this right triangle business? And so Galileo said, well, look, here's your right triangle, right? Okay. You know, ramp, uh, height to, to hypotenuse ratio, one to one, one over five. And Galileo secretly knew. Let me get this back. Galileo knew that if you have a ramp of this shape, then the amount of force that gravity gives you along the ramp, in the direction of the slope of the ramp, is the exact same amount as this downward arrow here. In other words, this triangle, now this is a geometric triangle, it's not a velocity triangle, it's not a distance triangle, it's just a regular ramp triangle, okay? He said, look, okay, this ramp is gonna have a push down force along the ramp of 0 0.02 newtons. So he said, look, I'll, I'll take these arrows and I'll turn them around a little bit. There they are, turned around. And he said, look, if you put an object on the ramp, then the gravity force is straight down. And because it's not perfectly flat, it's going to accelerate down the ramp. And the ratio of the down ramp force, that's this little arrow up here. Let me get my cursor back over here. So this little arrow here, is a ratio of 1 to 5 with the gravitational force. Okay? Now, most of the gravitational force is absorbed by the ramp. You know, but 20% uh, of it, for this ramp anyways, is uh, still in action. And you know, like here, we didn't get a full 9.8 meters per second squared of acceleration coming down the ramp. Uh, but we got some, and we measured it. You know, we calculated it. And so Galileo said, look, you know, Aristotle, that's nice. On, you're saying that 0 0.02 up on a flat plane guarantees motion. And he said, dude, that's what I get. I can build this ramp. And that's the same um, force that you get down the ramp. You know, gravity does this on this ramp. So... So whatever you're telling me, Aristotle, you are overestimating. So, so Galileo was able to say to Aristotle, dude, no. 
0.02, this ramp shows that you're way over. It's going to be way less than that. All right. And so a flat plane is, you know, in other words, it's going to be way less than that. The flat plane is going to re require. And, and in fact, no matter how small Aristotle says the push force is needed, so he said, okay, well, let me do my calculations again. And, you know, Galileo, or Aristotle didn't have any calculations. He was just, you know, they're just kind of making things up, you know, coming out of their head. And no matter how small he makes it, 0 0.002, 0 0.0002, uh, or anything smaller than that, Professor Galileo and you guys together can make a ramp with that much downward force, and therefore... Um, He's all, no matter what positive number Aristotle says, it's always going to be greater than what is required on that hypothetical horizontal plane. And Galileo says, I can defeat you every day. You know, it's a, it's a total beatdown. Matter of fact, Aristotle was busted. And really, that is, it, it did bust. His empire, but that was the day his empire busted, when Galileo uh, enunciated this argument. Because Galileo, um, Galileo's idea is true. And, you know, Aristotle was a smart guy, but he didn't think about it in these terms. It took another thousand something years, 2,000 years, I guess, uh, before Galileo could get to thinking about it that way. But this is where the Aristotle, the physics empire, you know, a lot of stuff Aristotle wrote was, was good, but his physics empire began to crumble on this day when Galileo showed him, nope, these ramps, no matter what force you say is required for constant velocity motion, I can d show you a ramp that makes that untrue. Your supposition will always be false. It will never be correct. So there is a state of motion on a horizontal surface that is constant velocity and no forces acting on it. And that was what uh, Aristotle could not stomach and could not fathom and would never have proposed. As a matter of fact, it, it never even came to his mind. But to Galileo it did. And we sometimes call that um, state of motion the inertial state. In, in other words, an object with no forces acting on it will stay in a state of motion at constant speed, constant direction. And th this actually became Sir Isaac Newton's first law of motion. And we call it, and, and, but the one who developed this law, you know, if there's no external forces acting on an object, it will stay in a straight line motion at constant speed. That was Galileo. He figured that one out. And uh, so it's, we call it the law of inertia. And it's, it's actually the first law of Galileo's or of Newton's three laws of motion. Now, it's, um, tell you what, it's 1015. And let's dismiss a few minutes early today. Uh, and let me, hold on, let me give you the, verbally the assignment. There will be homework three either this afternoon or maybe by lunchtime tomorrow. Also, I want you to make sure you get the textbook set. Raise your hand if you're registered on the website for the textbook. Okay, the rest of you get going uh, and get into chapter three, start reading ahead. And also, uh, if you haven't, look at Hidden Figures, the movie on Netflix. Okay, you're dismissed.